Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just to start off, I'll remind you that the second problem set, which deals with the world of seesaws and the beginning of wheels, is due on Wednesday at class time, so 1 o'clock. And talk about, you're welcome to talk about it among yourselves by any mechanism you like, uh, electronic or otherwise. And you're welcome to talk about it with me. The point of the problem sets, from my perspective, is always about trying to learn the material. And so just being frustrated and you're all by yourself uh, guessing at the answers is not the point of the whole exercise. It's, it's the act of learning, the, working your way through stuff. And if you can help each other do that, wonderful. If I can help you, great too. Any questions about problem set things? Other, other logistical stuff for the class? Okay, a um, couple questions that, that linger from last time talking about this is the world of rotation. One of them is actually sort of comes in in two, two forms. Um, is so, so what, how do you know what the center of mass of something is? Now, and I'll remind you that, that the, my way of thinking about a center of mass is it's the natural pivot of an object. So if you, if you have the object in empty space, get it, get it completely away from everything so it's feeling no forces at all and life is simple, and you give it a spin, you get it, go, you get it turning, it will naturally turn about a, about a point somewhere, the center of mass actually. So the center of mass is the natural pivot. The natural pivot typically is inside the object. So for most balls, for, for spherical balls, it's always somewhere inside the object, typically at the center if the ball is symmetric. Uh, for something like a horseshoe, which, you know, this U-shaped thing, the center of mass is in the, in the middle, it, it, approximately, it's in empty space. So you can actually touch the center of mass, but it will spin around that, that special point. So how do you actually find the center of mass other than spinning it and watching what point stays put? This is one of these basic mechanics problems that I haven't done myself for, well, <laughs> a lot of years, 40 years or something or other. And I, I, I think the way you do it, so 90% so sure, 95% sure, is suppose you want to find the center of mass of this board. You look for the point, and you can do it, there's a more efficient way of do it, doing it, but find the point. If you find the center of mass, and you go from the center of mass to every little piece of, real, of ordinary mass, every little smidgen of material that is, comprises this board, and you take the vector from the point that you have in mind, you, there's a vector that goes from that point to the, to the location, the position actually, of the little portion of mass, and you multiply the vector by that, that vector distance by the amount of mass there, and you add it up for all the little pieces of mass, and if you're actually at the center of mass, that grand sum will sum to zero. So there'll be, in a sense, as much mass out on one side at, dis at, at various distances as on the other side at various distances. So it's, the mass is, is spread uniformly around that point. The fact that you need that distance in there is important because it turns out that, that an object's rotational mass, do I have a long, yeah, these guys. An object's rotational mass, not so secretly, is, is based on its real ordinary mass. It's not a magic thing that shows up out of nowhere. The, the rotational mass of the stick, which is quite large, incidentally, this is stick is hard to twist back and forth. I'll come back to this very soon. It's hard to twist back and forth. And why? It's because the rotational mass of, of, of the stick is equal to the sum of all the little pieces of mass but each one has to be multiplied by a factor that has to do with how far it is from, from, from where you're pivoting it. And that factor is actually the square of the distance. So the portion of mass, so this one inch, this is a ruler is measured here in inches, that inch has a certain mass and it contributes in proportion to the square of its distance from the pivot, which is my hand. I'm, I'm making it, I'm actually at the center of this thing. I, here's the center. So it, and this detail, you don't have to memorize this. This is just these are. It's worth knowing that this is around. But each each inch inch worth of this wood contributes according to the square of its distance from the pivot. My hand is the pivot, so this one contributes a little bit. 
But this one out here, this inch, being way farther away, we square that distance and it contributes enormously. So this chunk out here contributes enormously. And you can kind of see why it contributes so much. is because as I twist this thing back and forth, and in effect, feel its rotational mass, how hard it is to make it undergo angular acceleration from rotating this way to rotating that way, that piece undergoes enormous acceleration. Watch it. It goes from heading up to heading down to heading up to heading down a lot, whereas this piece a little bit of acceleration. So that one is, we're very sensitive to that piece out there. It's contributing a lot. Is this, you, questions about this idea? Or ask me about this? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put off, I'll come back to this because I've got other things I wanna do before, then we'll come back and look at that rotational mass issue. All right, so, to, to make sure I've answered this question, if you are at the center of mass, if you found the center of mass, all the portions of mass in the object scaled by their distance away, all are sort of symmetrically spread out. And you're, you're at a point which, around which the mass is kind of distributed evenly in a, with, with distance in, involved. I don't, I don't know what I could do better than that, not on the fly. All right. Well, we're, we, what I'm trying to convey to you is an understanding of how seesaws work and with it a lot of other rotational stuff. And where I, where I essentially left off was I, I'd given you, I've talked about the, the physical quantities of rotation, which are, correspond nicely to the physical quantities of translation. So instead of having acceleration, which lives in the world of translation, you have angular acceleration and so on. And I then got as far as talking about the fact that, that if you do exert a torque on an object about either its center of mass or some other fixed, some other pivot that you have in mind. That you, I should say, the center of mass is the natural pivot of an object, but you can force the pivot of an object to be something different. This stick, its natural pivot is about, about where I'm holding it right now. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of the mass is symmetrically distributed around it in an interesting way. But I can force the pivot to be this in which case things are a little bit different. Um, so uh, if you do exert a, t a twist, that is to say a torque on an object about its pivot, it undergoes angular acceleration. And so if I take this board, which conveniently is su supported right at its own natural pivot, so, th so th there's only one pivot in this story. It's real simple. It's, it's right here. And if I exert a twist about it, it undergoes angular acceleration. Pfft, off it goes, right? And if I give it a twist in the other direction, I can slow it to a stop. Uh, so far, that's, we're, we're just doing all rotational stuff. And where, the, where the, the, a little bit of complexity shows up is that, that it is possible to produce a torque, that is the influence that causes angular acceleration, using a force which is the influence that causes ordinary acceleration. And how does that work? And I, and I got started in last time, and let me finish it carefully. So if this guy is free of, of overall torque, it, it is rotationally inertial, right? It, it's, it's almost free, it's not quite free. Uh, it's rotationally inertial, meaning it, 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 uh, it can turn at constant angular velocity. Well, if I, push on it in various ways with forces, I can cause it to undergo angular acceleration, which means I've evidently produced some sort of torque on it. So let me play with it for a moment and show you how you produce a torque with a force. Any questions about, about the distinction between forces and torques just to begin with? Just to make sure I'm, I've got everybody on board. Okay, so if I want to produce a torque on this board using a force, a few things to observe. Force is exerted right toward the pivot, which I'm doing now. Not very effective. In fact, I can come out here and go right toward the pivot. Also not very effective. It's hard to, it's hard to get exactly aligned. And then I was talking about opening a door last time. If you want to open a door, you grab the doorknob. You don't push the doorknob toward the hinges 
or away from the hinges. That doesn't produce torque. You have to go, in effect, at right angles to the door's surface. You push the door open or you know, away from you or toward you as, you as the surface is in front of you. And what you're doing is you are, you're using the, the rule that governs the production of a torque with a force. And the rule is this, and I'll, I said it last time and I'll do it right carefully now. If you want to produce a torque using a force, don't push at the pivot. If you push at the pivot, zero torque. If you, you want to come away from the, the pivot by a certain distance, and as you're doing that distance, imagine an ant walking along this board toward the right-ish, they're, they're creating not only a distance, but a direction they're traveling. And that direction and distance together are called the lever arm. So you come out at a lever arm, it's an awkward word to use, or, or not quite a word, but, so you come out here at a lever arm, and you push as much as possible at right angles to the lever arm. So it, 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 visualize the lever arm as, you know, vectors are often drawn as arrows. They have, they have a starting point, they have an ending point, and the arrow is pointing toward the ending point. So there's an arrow pointing from the pivot down to the point I'm gonna push. It's this long, which is about half a meter, foot and a half-ish, and I'll come out here and I'll push. I do not want to push along the lever arm, either that way or this way. I'll get no, no fun out of that. I want to come at right angles to the lever arm and push. And then when I do that, angular acceleration occurs. So I've evidently produced a torque using a force. And how much is the torque? It's, it's simple. I mean, it's simply the force you exert times that lever arm. And you only take, the only, the only contribution is from the portion of the force which has a direction and the lever arm which has a direction, only the part that's at right angles counts. If you're at cockeyed angles, um, the part that's, you, you can decompose funny angles that are not right angles and do into pieces. And the only piece that contributes is the one, the portion that's at right angles. Is that okay? So you can grab the doorknob of a door. You can open it by pushing it, not exactly at right angles to the surface, but at 45 degrees, but you're gonna waste a significant fraction of your push. Because a certain a significant fraction is, is gonna be in the wrong direction and not contribute. Okay? So, to produce a torque with a force, go to a lever arm, go out of the lever arm, um, push at right angles to the, to the lever arm. Now, there is a, a direction to torques. They're, they're vector quantities. So what is the direction of the torque? It turns out it follows a right-hand rule, too. It's a more awkward right-hand rule. If you go out the lever arm with your right index finger and your middle finger, there's my middle finger, um, is pointing in the direction I'm going to push, namely down. My thumb points in the direction of the, of the torque that is away from you. And you know, will you remember this? No. Will I test you on this? No. So, but you might as well know it's there. And you can, you, a lot of it you can figure out intuitively, and I'll ask you a question in a second, you, let, have you figured it out intuitively? But um, the, the, the point of saying this is that if I go out to a lever arm to the right and push down, I create a torque away from you. Hopefully that's okay, with, you know, it is using the right hand here. On the other hand, if I come over here to the left side of the, of the board, the seesaw board, and there's the lever arm now, and there's the push, it, and there's my thumb is toward you now, of my right hand, it's, that's a, this, this push produces a torque toward you. Those torques are in opposite directions. Over here, it's a torque away from you. Over here, it's a torque toward you. All right? That's, that's the, that underlies why a seesaw with two kids on it works. The kid, here's a seesaw, so we'll get it balanced. So it's, it's, it's pretty well balanced. And incidentally, the balancing you can think of in a bunch of different ways, all of which are, are this, uh, the underlying physics is the same. They look different in, in concept, but, but they actually all work out the, the same way. This, the, this is a balanced seesaw board, which, is, which means it's experiencing zero net torque and particularly no, zero net torque due to gravity. The fact that th there is gravity around it seems to have essentially no effect on it. You can think of it either, that the right-hand side 
having weight is pulling down and therefore it has lever pieces have lever arms that are to the right and the weight is down so the torque produced by those pieces is away from you. The parts on the left which have lever arms to the left and weights down, lever arms to the left, weight down, torque toward you, thumb is toward you. The two sides are, are balancing each other. One's getting a torque one way, one's getting a torque the other way, and, the, and that sums to zero. So it's experiencing no overall torque due to weight. The other way to think about it, I mean, hopefully that's vaguely followable. The other way to think about it is that the center of gravity, and this is one of the first that I'm now using the center of gravity as opposed to the center of mass. Center of gravity is, is the effective location of the, of the object's weight. The effective location of the seesaw board's weight is pretty much at its geometric center, right here. So you can think of gravity as pulling down on the seesaw board right at the center, which is where it's being supported. It's the pivot. So it's got a weight, which is a force, pulling down right at the pivot. Well, you can't produce a torque at a pivot. If you push on the hinges of a door, you won't open the door. No torque, no lever arm, no torque. So gravity is acting effectively on this seesaw bar right at the center where it can't produce a torque. All right? And yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about mobiles. You, you've seen hanging mobiles with various things dangling down on strings. And if you've done it right, everything just sort of sits there or maybe moves extremely slowly, but nothing's tipping abruptly. Nothing's experiencing a serious torque, so it undergoes angular acceleration. And how do you get that? Well, each piece, each piece and sub-piece and sub-sub-sub-piece of the mobile, and hopefully you can visualize these mobiles, um, is hanging from a point. It's, it's being supported from a particular point on, on say, a, a, the bar. The center of gravity of, e that, of that part of the mobile and everything below it is right there at that center or, 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 or directly below it. It's, in that, it's, a, there, it's all lined up, so there's no net torque on it. All right, but that's it. Let me come back. Let me come back to the seesaw. The seesaw, when two kids are playing on the seesaw, the kid on the right, as we view it, pushes, you, because of their weight, they end up pushing down on the seesaw board at a lever arm to the right. Lever arm to the right, push down. I'm, you know, I'm doing my, the, the, the right hand rule, but just bear with me if, it's, if it becomes hideously tedious. The point is, this, this kid is producing a torque on the seesaw that is away from us in the world of rotational directions. And this kid, coming over here on the left side of the seesaw board, produces a torque, lever arm to the left, lever arm to the left, force down, that's a torque toward us. The torques are in opposite directions. And if they are careful in how they sit, they can produce opposite torques on the seesaw bar, so the net torque on the seesaw bar is zero. It's pretty close. All right? So that's what you do when, when two semi-identical, you know, two identical twins sit at opposite ends of the board. They sit equally far apart on opposite ends, so their lever arms are opposite. They point in opposite directions, and the torques, therefore, in opposite directions. They cancel, sum to zero. All right? What if you got one heavy kid, one light kid? All right? All right. If the heavy kid is out here, sits on it, you know, you've got an astronaut. All right. So, so what do you do? <laughs> you little kid never goes on the seesaw again. Instead, you have the heavy kid reduce the heavy kid's lever arm. I'm, 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 I'm hunting for the right spot. We're almost, you know, we're close. There it is. And at this point, yes, I mean, yeah, still, I'm still not, not spot on, but the heavy kid is pushing down, in this case, five times as hard on the seesaw bar. In order to, to have the two torques cancel, the heavy kid has to be at one-fifth the distance from the pivot. Shrink that lever arm. So you push five times as hard, but you're at one-fifth the distance. The lever arm's one, only one-fifth uh, as long. 
the product of the, of the lever arm times the force gives you the same value, and you can balance. All right? So that's games on a seesaw. So what are the units of moment of inertia? Whew. Let me give you a moment. Moment of inertia, if you'll recall, is the physicist's name for rotational mass. And I can give you the, 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 the units of the other physical quantities. Now, let me do that first. The, the, the units of, of angular position is just an angle. And the angle to, for physicists is measured in radians, this, this, this natural unit of angle. Um, so it's, it's a certain number of radians. Uh, you, if you want it's a certain number of degrees, you can convert. There's a factor that converts radians and degrees and vice versa. The unit of angular velocity is radians per second. If you like, it can be degrees per second. So here's 90 degrees per second. Okay? And angular acceleration is angle per second per second. So it's angle per second squared. And again, the natural unit is radians per second squared, but, but uh, you can think of it in other units. The unit of torque. The unit of torque, is, it should be relatively easy to see that it is, because it, torques are, when their torques are produced by forces, uh, there's a lever arm involved, so it's, it's got a distance and a force. So it's torque is, the units of torque are the product of, a, of the units of distance times the units of force. So the, the, the metric unit of force is the Newton. I you know, occasionally bring this up. The, the, uh, the familiar unit of, of force is the pound, technically the pound force. And um, so the units of torque are a distance times a force. For example, the metric unit is the Newton, which is a unit of force, times the meter, which is the unit of distance, Newton meter. So uh, torques in the metric system, the SI system, are measured in Newton meters. In the US traditional system, awkward though it is, um, the units, and, and the reason the US system is so awkward is because most things are not factors of 10 of each other. Like they're two, quart, two, cups, two cups in a pint, two pints in a quart, four quarts in a, in a gallon, it's a big mess. Whereas the metric system, everything is multiples of 10. Very, very self-consistent and easy to work with if you're used to it. If you're not used to it, it's, you know, it's new. But to go back to the English system for, for torque, it's a force times a distance. And, it, and common units of force, the pound. Common units of distance, the foot, foot pounds. So torque in the US system is typically foot pounds. There are other variations. You can, use, you, know, you can have the foot, you can have the mile pound too. I mean, it's a unit of torque, but it's not a very familiar one. It's not used much. So, um, you, yeah, the unit, okay, that's the unit of torque. The unit of, of rotational mass or moment of inertia, I, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be mass distance squared, I think. So it's gonna be like kilogram meter squared. But don't, 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 don't hold me to it, I could be wrong on that. It's, you know, I never use it, so it's like, oh, I'd have to calculate it back out. All right? Important, you know, what should you take away from this? Is that things that are, that are balancing, that are not undergoing air, angular acceleration, are evidently experiencing uh, zero net torque. And if you go looking for the torques, you'll find they all sum to zero. In the case of the seesaw, it's because the kids are sitting at the right distances, uh, appropriate for their weight, such that their, their individual torques on the board sum to zero. Now, there are a zillion other applications of torques in the world, and I just, okay, since this class, from my perspective, is supposed to be in part tools for living, things that you ought to just have in, in, your, tool, in your toolkit, of your mental toolkit. I, I told you last time about opening jars, and, and jars and screws and bolts in, 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 our, uh, in our society. For the most part, they, are, they have right-hand threads which is to say they follow the right-hand rule. There are exceptions. They show up for, for deliberate reasons. No, nobody, uh, nobody has a box full of left-hand threaded things 
unless they really need them, because they're way more expensive, they're rare, they're obnoxious, because when you discover one, it doesn't work the way you expect it. Um, so most of the world's stuff is right-hand threaded. And what right-hand threaded means is that if you, if you rotate the, the, the widget that you're, that you're dealing with, according to the right-hand rule, you're, the, so that it, the surface moves in the direction of your fingers, the widget will move in the direction of your right-hand thumb. So for example, this is a right-handed threaded jar lid, like every other jar you've ever encountered. I mean, it, it might be worth making a left-handed jar just to frustrate people, but they probably exist somewhere for exactly that reason, like to go, ha, 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 look, it's a left-handed jar, but they're all right-handed, okay? Which means that if I take the surface of that, that lid and make it move in the direction of my, of my right-hand fingers, the jar lid will move in the direction of my thumb. Up, I will open the jar. And you want to close it, now you have to, you want it to go down. So your thumb's down, you want to turn the surface with your right hand fingers and it, it will move down, okay? Same with screws. The, I've never seen a left-handed wood screw. So this is a wood screw. I realize it's teeny tiny and you can, you can barely see it, but if I put the screwdriver in it and I take my hand and I move the surface of the screwdriver with my right hand, I'm gonna move the surface in the direction of my fingers the screw will move in the direction of my thumb. It will go into the wood. There are many better drivers than, the, m most screwdrivers you encounter have a flat blade like this, and the screws have flat, a flat slot to, to turn it's a, it. You know, it's a terrible closure system, but it's cheap. So they're much better ones. Um, yeah. I can say, yeah, look, look right there at that Philip said. This is, this, so this is a, this is a four, it, it, somewhat star-shaped driver. This one doesn't pop out of the slot so easily. What to tell you about screwdrivers? If you don't know how to use a screwdriver, hopefully you have used a screwdriver. Again, if you want to make the screw or bolt or whatever it is, move to your, to, to your right. You turn the screwdriver according to the right-hand rule, so your thumb points, my thumb now points to your right. I, I turn it that way. I turn it that way. And so that's the, you know, the righty-tighty is never very, that's not quite specific enough. All right? Screwdrivers, what else do I want to say about screwdrivers? Ah, if you go and buy the world's cheapest screwdrivers, and, and for better or worse, I don't have any really cheap screwdrivers in my lab. But if you buy really cheap screwdrivers in your lab, the handle is often really, really um, small diameter, which means that when you're twisting it, a process involves exerting forces at lever arms from the center. And you're, what you're really doing is you're, is you're grabbing each little part of the, of the plastic and you're pushing it with a force, and it's, you're pushing at right angles to the lever arm from the actual pivot of the screwdriver to where you push. If you make the, the handle very narrow, small radius, small diameter, you're not very far away from the pivot, so your lever arm is small. So cheapo screwdrivers, which, which, where they don't want to spend any money on the plastic, will put your hand too close to the, to the, to the pivot. So you, you have to use a big force exerted um, at a small lever arm to get a decent torque, and it hurts your hands. So better screwdrivers have big diameter grips. The bigger that diameter is, the better. I mean, apart from the fact you had to store it or something like that. But getting you know, a really big grip like that, you're now pushing very far from the pivot. You've got a big lever arm to work with. This is great. You can turn that screwdriver, even with modest forces, and it will rotate nicely and push your screw into the wood. Is that OK? Further tools for living. You can only turn wood screws, for example, with screwdrivers. If you want to put a bolt in, for example, your, the wheel of your, of your, the tire on your car burst or something, you know, had, it's flat. So you want to take off the current tire and you want to put on a new tire. That's going to involve removing 
bolts or nuts, t taking them out, and you're not gonna do it with a screwdriver, you're gonna do it with some sort of wrench. And what the wrench does, is it allows you to grab the head of a, of a bolt. So I've got bolts, I guess I should have brought up a giant bolt. I've got some of everything around, but okay. So, so this is a bolt that has a hexagonal top on it. And it's not unlike what you'd find in a car. And you need to grab it and rotate it and to take off, for example, to take off a bolt or, or a nut uh, and to make it move toward you. So, so suppose I'm working on a car. So here's the tire. It, it, it's broken. I want to take, take the nut off. If I want the nut to come off, I want it to come toward, toward me or toward you. We want to rotate it according to the right-hand rule, the usual thing, this way. That's, that takes it off, okay? Out it comes. And then you want to put it. New, you put the new wheel on, and now you want to put the nut or bolt back in, so you want to turn it the opposite direction so it moves into the wheel to grab it. And how do you, how do you get the torque that you want to make that happen? Well, you use some sort of wrench, and I've got a whole bunch of wrenches up here. Uh, so this is <laughs> it's one of my favorites, right? A typical toolbox will have a little version of this. this is, this is the uh, we go wild version. And it can grab the head of a head. This is actually is an adjustable wrench, which is particularly nice because you can pick any old shape. You'll, you, 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 it can work on many different size bolts and nuts. But you, you grab the, the flat surfaces in this. And now, be, to, make, to, do, to the, do the rotation, so here's the, ro the pivot around which you're, which you're going. The farther you go away from the pivot, the longer the lever arm becomes the more torque you can get for a certain force that, that you exert. So with a little wrench, you can produce modest torques um, using the forces you're, that you're capable of. With this wrench, because it's giant, you can produce enormous torques. And so a, a point to show you, it's like with my fingers, I can screw this bolt into here. Uh, if it gets tight, now I have to twist harder, more torque. I can't do it with my fingers anymore. I, don't, I can't summon up enough forces and stuff. Uh, it, with, I've got almost no lever arm to work with as I grab this and twist. But with the with wrench, and let me show you, this really is a, it, it's a bolt with a, with, with a metal in there. Is, well, it's, it's, t it's technically 3 8 inch. But it, the, met, the metal is it's not as big as your pinky, but it's a substantial portion of steel. And, as you tighten it, let me tighten it first using, I'll save the big guy for a, se for a second. To, to tighten it, I need to be able to grab the surface of the bolt, bolt head, which I can with this, this tool, we'll grab it. And this is what's called a torque wrench. This is a wrench that, has, that flexes as you twist. I can't do it by hand. But it's going to flex enough that when I exert really large torque, so if, I, if, I, if, if this is the bolt, I'll grab the bolt here. As I push the handle that way, that is a torque away from you guys. If I push the handle down. Um, the needle, this dial needle here will actually point to different values as, as the torque increases. It'll tell me how much torque I'm exerting. And the units it's, it's got here, it's in foot pounds. Well, one, one's in foot pounds. I told you that, force times distance. And the other is in metric units, mkg. Meter, meter kilograms, that doesn't, that's not a proper unit, but it, it evidently somebody's convention. So the, the point is that as I, as I twist this, it's now, I now have the bolt into the, into the nut as, as far as they will go, and any further torque I exert will begin to, as the torque builds up, and I'm, and I'm trying to make it build up, but what I want to do is I want to get some deflection in the, in the whole system. So the, what I can't show you is that the, the needle is beginning to shift across the dial because it's twisting hard. And what I really wanted to go to is I want to show you that there is a reason for putting on, when you're putting on your tires, for example, you want to put, you want to exert about the right torque on the nuts and bolts to, to hold your, the tires of your, uh, of your car on. If you exert too little torque as you tighten them up, they're not very tight. They don't hold the, the tire on very well. And the wheel on, and the wheel can wobble and or come loose. However, if you over tighten, if you exert too much torque on the, on the nuts, bolts, you can break the steel. 
So even though it's steel's tough stuff, but I, I just wanted to show you, you can break steel bolts. So I'm going to, I haven't tried this, but I'm confident I can do it. You can laugh at me if I fail. So I'm gripping the, the surface of the bolt, and now if I come around here like this, if I don't break the vise, let me get the vise more tightly held here. In fact, I need, I need to get the vise held more tightly. There, we use a wrench to tighten the vise. Okay. Now, having tightened the vise properly, all right. Oh, come on. Don't. Something's going to give. Maybe the vice. No. Yeah, I, 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 I tore off. What I, what I did is I, I rounded the, the nut into which I was putting the bolt. It's now, instead of having a hexagonal body, it's got a round body. I just shaved off all the metal. So I, I had hoped to actually break the bolt, which is what usually happens. And it's happened. Phys physics students, physics graduate students, for example, many of them have never really worked with materials, too much, you know, working on paper or on computers. And so you actually, you give them some uh, device to assemble with nuts and bolts. And they have no idea how, t how tight can you tighten the bolt? Well, maybe there's no limit. Uh, no, which is not true. So they over tighten it and they break the bolts. And sometimes they break the bolts in a, uh, in a piece where the, the broken part is, is no longer removable. It, it, there's no head to the nut or bolt. It's just stuck in there forever uh, and then destroyed, therefore. So all of us experimental physicists have, have war stories of stuff that was broken, but in particular nuts and bolts that were over tightened and broke. All right. Uh, is that super useful? Hopefully, it's, hopefully some of this is useful to you all. Oh, two more things to, to talk about in this context. Pliers, you know, wrenches, very, these are rotating devices. So this is a pair of well, channel locks. This is a, this is a, a simple pair, simple pliers. Hopefully you've seen these things around somewhere. They're not dissimilar from, well, they're related and not crackers. But, but if you, if you think of one, hold one piece stationary and rotate the other, you can grab stuff. You can grab something. For example, why not? A piece of chalk, OK? I'm grabbing a piece of chalk. As I push inward on this arm of, of, the, of the pliers with my finger, as I push inward, that produces a torque about the pivot. This is the pivot. That torque that I'm producing is not, oh man, this is tough. Right hand rule. Lever arm, force is toward you. So if I do it like this, the torque is toward you. I mean, I realize this is messy and whatever. The chalk is fighting me. It's exerting a, it's pushing out on the same, see, I'm, I'm going to push on this guy, right? Force is, lever arm, force toward you. The chalk, on that same rotating bar is pushing down on this end, down, at a lever arm that way. So lever arm, downward force, it's a, it's a torque away from you. It's fighting my torque. Is that okay? And right now the, the torque's summed to zero. But I'm way out here at a big lever arm. So with a fairly modest force, I can cause that chalk to fight me back with a big force. Right, because it's got a little lever arm to work with. And therefore, I, I can crush it. I just, because I'm out here at this big lever arm, my little force on it makes, makes it fight me with a, because it's got a teeny lever arm with a huge force which it can't, ultimately can't exert. It eventually just gives up and dies. Okay, that is the same principle behind these guys. The longer the arm's out here, the more you can do it. 
uh, the cutters for, for plants. You know, you work, if you work in the garden and you're trying to, you're trying to cut uh, branches off of some tree that's died. Again, long lever arms. If you're stealing bicycles, you get the bolt cutters, same idea. Um, scissors, you try to cut not chalk, but paper, same idea. And you, you, you probably know from experience that if you want to cut really heavy paper, by, by, you're going to produce a torque in one direction, the paper is going to produce a torque in the opposite direction. You will fight each other to, to stalemate until your torque eventually is bigger than, than the chalk's or the paper's torque. How do you make the paper's torque uh, particularly small? Shove the paper deep into the jaws of, of the scissors, very close to the pivot. Basically give it no lever arm to work with. Now it can't fight you very well. And so you win, you win easily and cut it. Is that okay? I mean, I'm saying it's a little shorthand, and you may have to think about it after the fact. But hopefully that's okay. All right. I think I've done justice to all my toys and yeah. Uh, one last thing. One last thing. I did tell you about. I remember back this. I said moment of inertia depends on distance. And the farther you take the mass away from the center, the ordinary mass, the more it contributes to moment of inertia. Ah, uh, rotational mass. Remember that one? So I've got two bars here. They have the same mass, and therefore the same weight, because weight and mass go together. But they don't have the same location of the mass. And I can use two, two volunteers to, to, to measure the rotational mass of these two things by rotating them back and forth, basically making them undergo angular acceleration. Two volunteers? Okay, Alex. Yeah. One more? Uh, I'll do it with you. Here. Here we go. Okay. Come on up. So, so here's the idea. They have the same mass. I want, want you, you, you feel the, by feeling the weight, you can tell that they're, they're, they're about the same weight, right? And if you, if you push them toward me, about the same mass, okay? So, so we're all good. Now, here's the deal. When I say go, Alex is going to try to rotationally accelerate it, angrily accelerate it, back and forth as fast as he can, and I will do the same. And the, the, because the anger, because anger, sorry, rotational mass is the opposition, the fighting to anger acceleration, and we have different rotational masses, one of us will be able to do it more easily than the other. Okay? Ready? Get set? Go. What's your problem? <laughs> no problem here, hey. Now we'll trade. Okay. Ready? Get set? Go. What's your problem? <laughs> Where is the mass located in Alex's bar right now? It, is it at the ends or in the center? It's in the center. He's holding it inside his hand. It's hidden inside a bar. Where's the mass in my bar? At the ends. And so this is one of these ones that, that in a minute, when I, I, I've still got a few things to say. Uh, thanks, Alex. <laughs> Come up and try it. The difference is striking. It doesn't take a lot of movement of the mass inside the, the system to dramatically change its rotational mass. Because the rotational mass effect, uh, it depends on the square of the distance from the center. So moving it out really has a huge effect. Let, let me give you last bits, last bits uh, appropriate for the, or necessary for the problem set. The next topic, I wanted to start the next topic, and I figured I'd get just about this far. Friction. Uh, the, this, the topic is wheels. Why do we have wheels on vehicles? And the, the, the oversimple answer is to get rid of friction. And actually, they don't get rid of friction, but they change the type of friction. And here's the, here's the idea. That if you, let me get back to the big kid. If you have, the kid sits in a wagon and no wheels. So this is, this poor wagon has, has lived its entire life without its wheels installed, and I've always felt sorry for it. And I mean to swap the wheels, but I didn't never do it. Okay, so this wagon doesn't move even though I'm pulling on the string. I'm currently, come on, come on. Come. It doesn't, doesn't come, and the reason it doesn't, doesn't come with me, doesn't accelerate in the direction of the force I'm exerting on it, is because I'm not the only thing exerting a force on it. It's got a second force in the horizontal direction. Don't worry about the vertical. 
the horizontal direction, there's a second force. And the second force is a force of friction that the table is exerting on the wagon. So the table is exerting a force. And, and if I'm pulling to the left, which way do you think the table is pushing on the wagon? Toward the right. And actually, the, the table is clever, so that if I try to pull the wagon to the right, the, now the table pushes to the left. So what's happening is when two surfaces touch each other, we already know that they push apart with, a, with what are known as support forces, what I call support forces. And those forces are perpendicular to surfaces. So, there, so in this case, there's a support force up from the table on the wagon, and there's a support force down from the wagon on the table. Those are actually there. They're part of the old stories. However, when I begin to pull on the wagon, another kind of force shows up. And this type of force is not perpendicular to surfaces. It's parallel to the surfaces. It's along the surfaces. So those along the surface forces are called frictional forces. And they're distinct in the, opposite, the, other, the other direction from support forces. And the frictional forces always act to try to, to uh, reduce or, or, or bring to zero the relative velocities of the two surfaces. So if, if the wagon is, is trying to head to the left or is actually heading to the left the, the, and the table is motionless, there's a relative motion between the two objects. And the two objects push on each other with frictional forces trying to bring themselves to the same velocity. The table, because it's essentially immovable and it's sitting there at velocity zero, is always going to win this, this situation. And so that whenever I try to slide this wagon across the table, the table will exert a frictional force on the wagon opposite the, fr the wagon's velocity. If the, if the wagon's moving to the left, the table pushes to the right. If the wagon is moving to the right, the table pushes to the left. It always causes acceleration opposite the wagon's velocity. Deceleration, in other words, to use shorthand, and brings the wagon to rest. So that's, that's the nature of frictional forces in general. What I do want to point out to be useful to you is there are two types of friction. Actually, there are more than two, but the two major types. One of them is the, is the friction between two surfaces that are not yet sliding across one another. They're, they're thinking about it, but they're not making any progress yet. So when I begin to pull on this wagon, the table begins to push to the right equally hard, you know, basically canceling my force. And, it, and the table's rightward force on the wagon is adjustable. As I pull a, a little, I get a little rightward frictional force. If I pull a lot, we get a big rightward frictional force. And there is a limit to how hard that frictional force can, can push. If I pull super hard, I win. And we get acceleration. The fr frictional force says I can't push that hard anymore. Those kind of frictional forces, the forces between two surfaces that aren't moving yet, they're called static frictional forces. And they're variable. They, they adjust from zero to a maximum. And they, are, they, they, they work to try to keep the motion from starting. Once the motion is, is going, then there's another kind of frictional force that shows up called sliding friction. Or you might have heard it as dynamic friction. But, but it's the friction between two surfaces that are actively sliding. And it's mostly a, a, a specific value. It has to do with how hard the surfaces are pressed against each other and what they're made of. But what I do want to point out, and, to be, and, I'll, and I'll finish with, with one more demonstration, that when two surfaces are not sliding across each other yet, static friction, there's no, no work being done anywhere, because nothing's moving. There's no distance. But once the sliding has started, now there's a distance being traveled. There's a force, there are forces around. There are distances being traveled. There can be work done. And when, and when you look carefully into it, which we'll do next time, the, the work that's done is always involves a, a negative value. Energy is being sucked out of the system. For example, the moving wagon slows to a stop. Its kinetic energy vanishes. Where did it go? It goes into thermal form. It becomes thermal energy, which is ordinary energy, but chopped up into little pieces. And so this is where I'm going to try to finish off here. You know, if you spin a, a piece of wood in another piece of wood fast enough, the rubbing effect, which is a lot like you do in this, is enough to make smoke and possibly fire. So we'll go for, we'll go for smoke for sure. Come on.
I'm getting it. Hey! Can you see the smoke? Yay! All right. So, sliding friction wastes energy. It takes useful work, like what I was doing by pushing the bow and having it move in the direction by force, and turns it into thermal energy. All right, we'll, we'll continue on Wednesday.